Hello and welcome. I'm Peter, and we're here to make progress, not perfection. But on that way to progress, we need to learn about conditioning so we can better understand the importance of something like this. Your punish right there on the forward four too. Anakin already starting to poke away. Yeah, just see Anakin just. <laughs> we hear this term a lot, especially in the context of fighting games. Conditioning. Finally thought that the conditioning was there to, to throw it out. Did you see what Sonic just did? He conditioned him? He just conditioned everyone to duck. And it's this exact principle that allows a player like Anakin to scare a player like JDCR into doing this. Multiple low parries in anticipation of a low. It's pretty difficult to get a player the caliber of JDCR to do this if you or I tried to do this, it probably wouldn't work, but somehow Anakin does. And even the best of players fall victim to conditioning at some point in time. Before making this video, I decided to poll my community to see how well they knew the term conditioning. And almost everyone answered with some variation of getting the opponent used to a pattern and then mixing him up. From the looks of it, the majority of players understand on a basic level what conditioning is with the exception of these three guys. <laughs> deep conditioners. It works deep, repairs fast, for instant hair transformation. Good responses, guys. Good responses. <laughs> Fucking crack me up. Anyways, it seems that the majority of players understand the basic concept of conditioning. However, the answers that were given to me are both correct and incorrect. The official definition of conditioning is a simple form of learning involving the formation, strengthening, and weakening of an association between a stimulus and a response. Mix-ups or 50-50s are just something that we profit from the conditioning process, not the conditioning process itself. Now let's investigate the conditioning process and figure out how Anakin was able to make JDCR do this, starting with the divide between two specific categories classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Classical conditioning was first studied by Ivan Pavlov in the 1890s and focused on involuntary automatic behaviors. He performed the world famous experiment with dogs and ringing bells, conditioning dogs to salivate with the ringing of a bell by pairing food with it. This type of conditioning is limited to things like salivating, blinking, and emotional feelings like uh, fear, or euphoria, which doesn't really apply here to fighting games, so let's move on. Operant conditioning. This was a term coined by B.F. Skinner in 1937 and consists of learning through the consequences of one's behavior instead of mere association. Skinner believed that classical conditioning was far too simplistic to completely explain complex human behavior, so he proposed the best way to understand behavior is to look at the causes of an action and its consequences. The most well-known examples was through the use of his invention called the Skinner Box. This box rewarded test animals with food for completing a task or punishing them with a weak electrical shock until a task was completed. As we understand, this type of learning is a reward-based learning and can be extremely effective in conditioning animals to doing, well, almost anything, including something like teaching pigeons to play ping pong. This is the type of conditioning we usually refer to in the FGC because it focuses on strengthening and weakening voluntary behaviors by reinforcement or punishment. Reinforcing a behavior seeks to increase the desired behavior, whereas punishment seeks to decrease the desired behavior. In fighting games, punishment is the most well-known operant conditioning method. Take for instance Super Smash Bros, where rolling can be a very powerful defensive option to avoid attacks and create space with its combination of movement and invulnerability frames. If an opponent rolls constantly in a predictable manner, it can be punished, which can dissuade the opponent from using this option. Reinforcement, on the other hand, can play a huge role in opening up an opponent's defense. For example, in Tekken, if an opponent is mostly stand blocking and not crouch blocking, a player may perform multiple mid attacks on their opponent to reinforce the behavior of stand blocking. As a result, when it comes time to throw out a chunky low attack, it would be less likely to be blocked or low parried. The concept of reinforcing and punishing behaviors is generally understood by fledgling players and grizzled veterans alike. But 
What if the rabbit hole goes deeper? You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. While conditioning consists of reinforcing and punishing behaviors, B.F. Skinner's experiments with mice and pigeons demonstrated that these techniques can be used in either a positive way or a negative way. Let's take a look. Now, when I refer to positive and negative here, I'm not referring to good or bad. Positive doesn't mean good, negative doesn't mean bad, but rather the addition or removal of something here. First up is positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is adding a reward for desired behavior to further encourage it. For example, in a real world scenario, a parent giving their child allowance when the child gets good grades. When the child gets good grades, they get allowance. And in a fighting game example, remember the thing we talked about earlier about using mid attacks to keep the opponent stand blocking? This is a prime example of positive reinforcement. We are encouraging the opponent to continue to stand block by using mid attacks. This is telling them, hey, look, they are using mid attacks, I'm stand blocking, I'm being rewarded. So that further on down the line, if and when we need to use a low attack, it would be less likely for it to be blocked. Moving right along, we have negative reinforcement. Now, negative reinforcement is the removal of an undesired event or outcome in order to encourage a behavior like when a parent nags their child about doing homework. Have you done your homework yet? But stops nagging once homework has been completed. A fighting game example of this? This is the Anakin example. A, a fighting game example of this is when a player continuously throws out chip lows after chip lows after chip lows until an opponent finally decides to respect it and either low block it, low parry it, or challenge it, right? Oftentimes in fighting games, initially, beginner players will gravitate towards this. They'll go for low, low, mid, or low, low, overhead, right? And that's where you profit from the conditioning. When your opponent finally decides to respect it, block low, and you launch them with a mid. Next up, we have positive punishment. Now, positive punishment adds an unfavorable event or outcome to dissuade a behavior, such as a parent spanking their child for misbehaving. This is found in literally every fucking fighting game ever made. Block punishing and whip punishing, baby. They present the opponent with an unfavorable outcome that dissuades the use of unsafe attacks. By dissuading the opponent with a punish, for using an unsafe attack, we're able to limit the opponent's pool of viable attacks. This is incredibly, incredibly important because this will increase their predictability because they're no longer using those moves and potentially forcing the opponent to play outside of their comfort zones and throw out attacks that they wouldn't otherwise. If opponent is being punished constantly for a particular attack, eventually they'll switch to something else. Or, or you know, they lose. Last but not least, we got negative punishment. Now, negative punishment looks to remove a favorable event or outcome to dissuade a particular behavior. Consider the example of a parent taking away a child's video game console or computer for misbehaving. Dad, no, 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 dad, no, no. What are you doing, dad? Dad, no, no, dad, no. I warned you. Dad, no. <laughs> dad, no. Oh. Dad, dad, no. Oh. Dad, no. Oh. Dad. <laughs> So, how does this apply in a fighting game? What can you possibly remove from a player in a fighting game? Well, in Super Smash Bros., a player's shield is a vital resource that can be pressured and depleted. Shielding is a key defensive option in the game, but by whittling away at this resource with projectiles and other attacks, we can dissuade an opponent from shielding. And by dissuading an opponent from shielding, this opens up a whole world of opportunities, forcing the opponent possibly to roll more, or forcing the opponent to go more on the offensive, which they may or may not be comfortable with. So why is knowing all of this important? Well, to be frank, these four methods of operant conditioning help build the foundation of the mix by either rewarding or punishing a behavior. We are influencing our opponent's perception of right 
and wrong, enabling us to take advantage of their thought patterns. Philip Zimbardo, a famous psychologist, once said, the most dramatic instances of direct behavior change and mind control are not the consequences of exotic forms of influence such as hypnosis, psychotropic drugs, or, or brainwashing, but rather the systematic manipulation of the most mundane aspects of human nature over time in confined settings. If we're able to present the opponent the same scenario or sequence of scenarios over time, we can eventually influence them to behave in a predictable manner and predictability opens the floodgates for counterplay and big damage opportunities. Whether it's choosing to take away a defensive option or perhaps mixing up the opponent, none of it really matters if the foundations of conditioning are not set. So that's why when we look back at this game right here, Anakin is able to get JDCR, a world-renowned player, to perform multiple low parries like a puppet. Through his use of negative reinforcement throughout the rounds leading up to this point, constantly peppering JDCR with low pokes relentlessly, Anakin was able to impose fear, the fear of a possible low, and take advantage of the situation. Thanks for watching guys and joining me on this video. Also, thank you so much patrons for your ever so gracious support. Without you, this would have not have been possible. And if you're new here and you like what you see, consider subscribing and hitting that bell notification icon. Below in the descriptions as always, I also have my links to my Discord, Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon page. See you next time.